The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Okay, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker, is, uh, Professor Pucel Moreno from uh, Florida Atlantic University, who's uh, done uh, uh, for some time research on uh, corrosion and uh, related topics such as um, electrical methods. All right, Professor Moreno, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Jean Beaulieu, uh, Juju Wu, and Victor Echeverria. Um, so our main sponsor is the Florida Department of Transportation, and you might know we have more than 5,000 bridges in Florida, so corrosion is an issue. And also we know that diffusivity through the concrete uh, is an important factor to determine the service life, uh, how long it's going to take before corrosion initiates. And also based on past research, both uh, FDOT and other places, uh, the resistivity has been correlated with the chloride, uh, chloride diffusivity in concrete. Um, although I'm going to be presenting uh, results on how the resistivity changes as a function of time, I also would like to introduce the idea that uh, the resistivity can be used to calculate the aging factor. Uh, Mangat, Thomas, Thomas, Banford, and others have suggested that the diffusivity is a function of time and if you measure the diffusivity <laughs> uh, time not, you, and also uh, then you can uh, use this equation to uh, estimate how the resistivity is going to uh, change as a function of time. If you do a few of these measurements, I do the fitting. And usually the value of the aging factor M uh, ranges between zero and one. And this is an example from uh, research by Gorf, but if we were to normalize between the DT and D naught, we do that in linear scale. This is the, the kind of results that you would get for five different values of N. And if you do this in log log scale, you get uh, this type of results. Um, so some of the things that we want to uh, investigate is the uh, value of M, how this varies as you change the mixed proportionals and how uh, it affects the different curing conditions. Uh, the effect of elevated temperature curing uh, is, has not been very well understood uh, uh, how it would affect the value of M. And the, uh, usually the RCP test, as someone mentioned before, uh, it takes quite a bit of time before you can uh, obtain the results by traditional methods. Um, and also, it has been known for some time, uh, the Nernst-Einstein uh, equation that can connect the diffusivity and resistivity. And using the equation that I introduced in the previous slide, then we can correlate the resistivity as a function of time in a similar manner, just that in this case, we are going to have a value of M that has a negative uh, coefficient. Um, but if we rearrange this equation, then we can obtain M uh, by using this equation in here, by the two log log uh, uh, values. And this aging effect on diffusivity of concrete can be therefore uh, uh, obtained by electrical resistivity. Um, as the, uh, Dr. Thomas mentioned in the first talk, we, when you do that, you are not including the binding or how the surface concentration of the chlorides are changing uh, um, versus time. And therefore, if you want to also include that in your resistivity measurements, you need to immerse your samples in uh, chloride solution. Um, Andrade and collaborators suggested this approach uh, for resistivity. I just want to acknowledge that, um, but we take it from there. And some of the objectives for this study is to uh, investigate how the resistivity and the aging factor changes with time, to uh, study how the aging factor is affected by curing the current regime. That means if you immerse it fully in water uh, versus uh, put it in the fog room or high humidity or immersing in sodium chloride solution or in lime water. And also 
how the uh, uh, curing the specimens in elevated temperature, how that would affect the resistivity and therefore the aging factor. And also, what is the effect of the water to cement ratio for on the resistivity as a function of time, but also how that affects the aging factor. Something that I forgot to mention when I, a couple of slides ago, is that M is assumed to be a constant value. And we are going to see that we are finding that that is not necessarily the case. Um, so the other uh, factor that we are trying to, uh, in this research is to uh, see what is the effect of having different uh, percentages of fly ash, for example, uh, uh, on the resistivity as a function of time and on the aging factor. So we are presenting three results from three different projects. Uh, so group one was prepared with uh, Portland cement and cementitious component of 390 and fly ash 20%, uh, the rest, the balance uh, OPC and also 20% uh, fly ash and 8% silica fume. And for most of these mixes, we use uh, number 67 grading uh, coarse aggregate limestone from Florida, and only in one of them we use number 57. And the current regimes for this group were uh, placed in the specimens. Uh, these are cylinders four by eight or 10 centimeters diameter by 20 centimeters tall. And in the fog room, all the time, fog room, for 60 days followed by exposure in high humidity environment. Um, we are going to touch a little bit on some that we put in the fog room, then laboratory humidity, and then transfer to high humidity environment. And we also include some that we immerse in tap water and others that were immersed in sodium chloride. And that was done only for those with fly ash and fly ash plus silica fume. For respect to the wire to cement ratio, we investigated nine mixes and we have three water to cement ratios. The idea is to try to approach the, com the water to cement tissues that uh, is used in the FLIR for a very aggressive environments in Florida, ranging from 0 0.35 to 0 0.47, and three base uh, com uh, mixed compositions, 20% fly ash, 20% fly ash, and 8% silica fume, and 50% slag. And for these uh, specimens, I'm only going to talk uh, about those that were cured at room temperature all the time in a high humidity chamber. And for this, the uh, coarse aggregate was number 57. And finally, the third group uh, is 12 different mixes that were prepared with different amounts of fly ash from 20%, 30%, 40%, 50% 50 with limestone and others that had only a slack 50% and 17% and two ternary mixes where we have 10% and 60% uh, slack and 20% uh, fly ash and 50% slack. And uh, another factor that we touch a little bit is the effect of uh, having granite versus limestone as the coarse aggregate. And for these uh, specimens, the grading was uh, 89 and the water to cement tissues ratio was 0 0.41. And all the different three groups that I had mentioned were prepared at uh, the state materials office at uh, the Florida Department of Transportation. And usually, like for these mixes, we prepare around 60 cylinders per mix <coughs> because of the different environments and additional tests that I'm not going to be able to cover today here. Um, but for this, we es uh, expose the specimens in two different uh, regimes, two different methods, immersed in uh, lime water at 21 degrees and also in an elevated uh, room at uh, about 38 degrees also with, with the samples uh, immersed in lime water. Um, moment, the, then three curing regimes were investigated, room temperature all the time, two days at room temperature and then uh, transferred to the elevated temperature room for the remaining time of the exposure and two days in the mouse, room temperature, 26 days at elevated temperature and then transferred back to room temperature in high hu uh, immersed in the lime water. And for this group, what we did is that we left the specimens for two days in the mold, and then we start doing the measurements from there um, and transferring to the corresponding. And similarly to the previous speaker, we used the Wenner method approach as per uh, uh, FDOT standard. Now it's also an ASHTO standard. And we corrected all the measurements for the geometric factor after Morris and Sagues and Moreno, not, not myself, but another Moreno. <laughs> and uh, the effect for the resistivity, I don't have time to cover that. As, uh, sorry, the effect of temperature and resistivity, we normalize our values via a methodology that we develop. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have also the time, but 
we convert all the values that I'm going to show you to 21 degrees. So all the values that you are going to see are with, uh, bulk uh, resistivity values. And let me briefly show you typical results of the resistivity versus time. In this axis, we have time up to 1,000 days. Oops, sorry. Um, and in this axis, we have uh, the resistivity in kilo ohms per meter for three current regimes, room temperature all the time, uh, two uh, days room temperature, 26 elevated temperature room, and the remaining at room temperature, and the black circles all the time in the elevated temperature room after two days. And you can see that indeed there is a difference on how is the, what is the maximum value that you achieve after prolonged exposure of time. Um, to compare the axis here goes up to 90. In this case, for 50% fly ash, there is a significant increase, but you can see that the values are increasing at a slower rate at the early days, but then there is a couple of changes in the slope, one in here, another one in here, and then goes back to a, a less steep slope. And in this case, the maximum resistivity reached values close to 200 uh, kilo ohm centimeter in fully saturated conditions. And in the case for group one, we have three different environments. The triangles correspond to fog room all the time, a squares, 60 days fog room, then transfer to high humidity. You can see that maybe that's an effect of not being fully saturated, just barely less than full saturation. And finally, the uh, diamonds corresponds to those that were exposed to laboratory uh, humidity for some time, then put back into high humidity and almost recover to the value that was observed for those that are in high humidity. Maybe a little bit of the uh, carbonation took place during that time. With respect to the silica fume, I'm presenting you a slightly different group in here. We have fog room and then uh, specimens that were in tap water all the time, and in here, uh, what happens when we put the specimens in 3.5% sodium chloride solution? So there is a reduction on the uh, resistivity when you include uh, exposure to sodium chloride. Again, similar to what the first speaker was referring earlier today. So we calculated based with the formulas that I introduced earlier, uh, what is the aging factor, and turns out that if you are not in full saturation, uh, even for OPC, there is a few days up to maybe 200 days where there is a slight transient, and then the value of the aging factor M remains pretty much constant, close to 0.2, whereas that that was in the fog room all the time had a value of around 0.1. With respect with the fly ash, I'm showing you uh, several. I'm only going to talk a little bit about one of them in here. You can see that there is a monotonic decrease uh, for this black dose, those that were exposed in sodium chloride, for example, and eventually reach a value about 0.4 after 800 days. It doesn't change that much anymore. And similarly, for those with fly ash and silica fume, uh, there is a decay. But in this case, there is a second, uh, a plateau that takes place about 80 days or so remains for 100 days there, and then a continuation. We believe that this is mainly for the silica fume, and there is a delay on the fly ash reaction, and then uh, the, it's dominated by the phosphorylonic reaction that is taking place on the fly ash. And in this picture here on the right, what we have combined is the effect of the uh, change uh, of the aging factor as a function of time for uh, Portland cement, uh, fly ash, and uh, silica, fly ash plus silica fume. And you can see that the uh, value for uh, OPC is about 0.1, for uh, fly ash plus silica fume is about 0.4, and for uh, the only fly ash 20% is about 0.5. But what do we do with this information? Well, what we decide, traditionally what people have suggested, sorry, is to use a constant value to calculate the, uh, try to predict what is the diffusivity, or in this case the resistivity at longer time. So if you use, and you only do your measurements during the first 50 days or so, then you are going to over predict what is the uh, resistivity at, uh, let's say, 400 days. And on the other hand, if you use the value that you measure at 800 days or so, uh, in that case, you are going to underpredict the resistivity for a good amount of time in there. And we observe the same for the fly ash, and this one I forgot to mention, I was referring to the fly ash plus silica fume, whereas in the case for the OPC, pretty much using a constant value is reasonable. So what we did, let's do an engineering approach, and let's define T0 
T1, uh, T2, and bracket. And you see if you do that, then uh, you have a good fit. But more importantly is that the M value, if you choose, for example, 200 days and all subsequent, subsequent measurements to calculate the uh, using T0 and M2, the resistivity doesn't change that much, which means then that the fusivity also is not going to change that much from that point on, okay? And, and we did something similar for uh, uh, the one with fly ash, and this work has been recently published in uh, construction and building materials. With respect with the wire to cement ratio, this is what happens for uh, fly ash 20%, uh, the larger values, of course, corresponds to the lower, well, sorry about that, to the lower wire to cement ratio, the intermediate wire to cement ratio, oops, ah, this mouse is not behaving. And in here we have the highest wire to cement ratio. So between 20 kilo ohms and 40 kilo ohms, depending on how much water uh, you, uh, versus cementition you have, if you put a little bit of silica fume to that mix and uh, the same amount of cement tissues, the uh, amount, uh, the resistivity value uh, towards 600 days is uh, about uh, a little more than 2.5 times the one that you measure uh, for fly ash. And as the previous speaker mentioned, the effect uh, of having a slack, uh, it reacts relatively fast and then the values are not that different one from the other unless you reach uh, later days, like in here, 400 days to 600 days, you can see a little bit better separation between uh, the uh, higher wire to cement ratio and the lower wire to cement ratio. And we calculated the uh, M values for this, the aging factors, and you can see that in this case, the lowest uh, M values correspond to those that had the uh, to higher wire to cement ratio. The lower wire to cement ratio had uh, M value of 0.6 at, at 600 days, whereas the one for uh, uh, the, the two higher wire to cement ratio was close to 4.5 or so. And for those that had fly ash and silica fume, you can see that the, there is the transition, a monotonic decay, and then a plateau that appears to take place. And the values range between 0.4 uh, 0.35 and 0.4 or so. Whereas for the slack, it's clearly that the value of the aging factor ranges around two at, uh, extended period, after extended periods of exposure. And in this case, the transition, we can say that there is a difference of what, when this takes place for the different composition, about 400 days for fly ash, 300 days for fly ash and silica fume, and 200 days uh, on slack specimens. Um, so we did similar, uh, approach to what I described earlier, and you can see here for, uh, uh, we bracket if only for two, and I guess I'm running out of time, <laughs> two more minutes. So let me briefly describe what takes place when you have uh, different amounts of fly ash. This is what takes place for 20%, 30%, 40%, and interestingly, the direction of the uh, aging factor as a function of time increases when you have uh, high percentage of 50% fly ash. And that takes place not just for limestone, but also for granite. And if you have a slack and you add a little bit of fly ash, that brings up the aging factor as well. And the T naught for these specimens were 28 days. Um, we did something similar for those that were two days in the room temperature, transferred to elevated temperature. And because the resistivity was high to begin with, and, and then there is a, sorry, uh, uh, reduction on the uh, reaction rates, then the, ah, the, the, uh, <coughs> the, 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 the trend of the, the M, M factor uh, is opposite, uh, is increasing as a function of time, but then it stabilizes between 0 0.25 and uh, 0 0.5. Um, in the interest of time, I just wanted to show you something that we are working right now. This is a research in progress. Uh, similarly, what people have done for the maturity method, we are trying to see if using a hyperbolic method will be able to feed some of these uh, results for the different uh, curing exposures. And so far, for some of the mixes, we have reasonable results. For those that have 50% uh, fly ash, we are not successful to do that. And the main point of this is that the implication of having a DT and MT, I mean, if the resistivity is changing as a function of time, and as we know so that that's correlated to the diffusivity as a function of time, and what the measurements that I have shown you of the aging factor, 
that changes as a function of time. Then after some time, if you have something that has an M of say 0.5, it's likely that a 1,000 days is going to have a significantly a smaller M value. And that needs to be considered when you are doing your uh, service life predictions. So I'm not going to go to the conclusions and thank you for your attention and just to, this is the terrible place where I have to go every day to <laughs> do my job. <laughs> <laughs>